So back in the day, there was a bumper sticker around the Naval Air Station Oceana that read, U.S. Navy 4, Libya 0. And that refers to the number of F-14 kills over the Libyan Air Force in two different incidents. One happened in 1981 and the other happened in 1989. So in those days, dictator Muammar Gaddafi laid claim to the entire Gulf of Sidra as territorial water, and he created an imaginary line at the north part of the Gulf that he called the Line of Death. Sixth Fleet U.S. Navy did not recognize that as territorial waters, and so we used to do what's called Freedom of Navigation, FON Ops, to demonstrate to Gaddafi that we're not honoring his claim. And so we would fly combat air patrol and drive destroyers down there, kind of daring him to do something about it. And in some cases he did. In two specific cases, he did with bad effects for the Libyan Air Force. So August of 1981, the USS Nimitz was operating in the Gulf of Sidra. Nimitz Air Wing was CAG-8. They had two Tomcat squadrons aboard, VF-41, the Black Aces, and VF-84, the Jolly Rogers. They later became the, the VF-103 Jolly Rogers, but in these days, it was VF-84, the Jolly Rogers. So early in the morning, 0600 about, they launch some Tomcats to do combat air patrol. So a section of VF-41 airplanes, lead airplane flown by the skipper, Commander Hank Kleeman, wing airplane flown by Lieutenant Larry Callsign Music Musinski. They're doing opposite racetrack so that they always have a radar pointed towards Libya, working with the E-2, the airborne early warning airplane that's based on the carrier, prop plane with a big dome, you've seen the pictures. And at some point, the lead Rio, Lieutenant Dave Venlet, gets a radar contact. This contact is speeding up and climbing. And so they're vectored to that contact. And little by little, they realize that these airplanes are going to not turn back towards Libya. They're coming at them. So at some point... The wingman says, I'm going to take high cover. So he flies up about 8,000 feet above. So this is um, eyeball shooter rolls, which is old school interceptor kind of thing. And at 10 miles, Skipper Kleeman gets a, a visual, a tally, and so he turns into them. Okay. So at the merge, the lead Libyan airplane shoots a missile. Okay, so at the time, they're not quite sure what kind of a missile it is. Later, it turns out that it was what we call an ATOL, which is an AA-2. So it's a Russian old-school missile that doesn't have forward ca quarter capability, so... It was stupid to fire it where they did. Now, the ROE on that deployment, Reagan-era ROE, was pretty restrictive, which is don't fire until you're fired upon. Right? You remember in Top Gun, the, the bald-headed ship CO slash carrier air wing CO slash squadron CO says, do not fire until fired upon. When Cougar's like, do I have permission to fire? even though the band is behind him. but So now, because they've been shot at, never mind out of the envelope, but they've been shot at, now they have met the ROE requirement to engage. So get to the merge. They both wind up turning on the same airplane. And once they realize they've done that, Kleeman gives the lead to his wingman, Music is his call sign, Musinski, and he goes after the other guy. So this dogfight only lasts about 60 seconds. In short order, Kleeman is behind 
His bandit, he shoots him down with a sidewinder. Splash one. Meanwhile, Music has followed his guy about 270 degrees, and he's now flying back south towards Libya. And so he's not sure whether he should engage, right? He's kind of not a threat anymore. But Kleeman is going, look, he was with him, guilt by association. And so Music says, Hank, you want me to shoot him down? And he says, yes, shoot him down. So Music shoots the other guy down. Now, as they're transiting back to the ship, the Admiral comes up and he says, you're cleared to do whatever you need to do to defend yourself. And they're like, okay, we already shot him down. Thanks for the guidance, Admiral. And Kleeman further says, splash to MiG-23. So he thinks the airplanes that they've shot down are MiG-23, floggers. That's the NATO code name of a MiG-23. In fact, they were Su-22 fitters, which is an air-to-ground airplane, not an air-to-air airplane. However, obviously they were loaded with air-to-air weapons in the form of the Atoll, which they shot out of the envelope. So they come back, conquering heroes. Kleeman is so excited, it takes him three tries to land. He bolters twice. And they're in the annals of history as SU-22 killers, not MiG killers, SU-22 killers. So the postmortem of the crews involved in the 1981 Gulf of Sidra incident, the VF-41 versus the SU-22 incident, is the lead Rio, Dave Vinlet, became a pilot. So he went back to flight school as a pilot got his wings, and flew Tomcats in the front seat. We call that retread when you go from Rio to pilot. Subsequent to that, he became an AEDO, Aviation Engineering Duty Officer, got in the acquisitions world. Ultimately, he was the commander of the Naval Air Systems Command down at Patuxent River in Southern Maryland. And then after that, his last job on active duty was he was the program manager for the F-35 program, which is a pretty big deal. So he had great success after that event. The wing pilot, Larry Music Musinski, left active duty, became a reserve pilot, but he joined the airlines. He flew for a small airline in the 80s called Presidential Airways that didn't last very long. And I don't know what happened to him after that. Maybe somebody in the comments can can tell me if you know. The... Wing Rio, Music's Rio, uh, Jim Anderson, actually, unfortunately, died in a skiing accident out west. The lead pilot, who I met when he was skipper of VF-101. So when I was a brand new ensign, just got my NFO wings, I show up to VF-101 and had my in brief with him, and he's a very understated guy. He's kind of like Bill Belichick, kind of. Didn't have a lot to say. Short, stout guy, no nonsense. And he just said, community needs good Rios, study hard. And that was it. But unfortunately, he was taxiing a Hornet on a wet day out west, and uh, the airplane did a ground loop, skidded, hit the mud and flipped over, and uh, he was, uh, he suffocated. So, uh, an unfortunate end for that great fighter pilot. So, fast forward a few years, 1986, there is the El Dorado Canyon strike on Libya, primarily flown by F-111s out of England, and Navy airplanes off of the USS Saratoga, A-6s. Um, We lost an F-111 in that event, but heightened tensions for the years after that. And then January of 1989, we had the second Gulf of Sidra incident involving two F-14s. So as a side note, I was in the squadron that was involved in that second incident 
VF-32, the swordsman. I left September of 1987 to go be a Rio flight instructor down in Pensacola. Um, I did the, the previous cruise aboard the USS John F. Kennedy to this cruise that, that this incident happened. So I knew all the guys involved very well. Um, the CO had been the executive officer when I was there um, and so forth. The guy who was in the CO's back seat had been the OPSO of VF-32 when I was the Rio training officer, so I knew him very well as well. Um, so they launch January 4th, 1989. They're doing Freedom of Navigation Ops. So Combat Air Patrol, just waiting to see if the Libyans will respond at all. So at some point, the lead Rio, who is Leo, the Rio was his call sign. He's flying with Beads, the skipper. They're in Gypsy 207. On their wing is Munster and a guy named Steve. We'll just call him Steve for the purposes of, of this episode. Um, so... Leo is a first to, I'm sorry, Munster is a first tour lieutenant and Steve is one of the department heads. He's a lieutenant commander. As I said, Beads is a squadron skipper. Leo the Rio has gone from being the squadron opso to the air wing opso, a job that I had later. It was my last fleet job. It's a cool job, great job. Um, now I'll say that Leo was super smart. He'd been a test and evaluation guy. He knew the back seat like nobody else. Very tactical guy. Um, so um, this ultimately was a semi-dubious event for he and Beads. Um, but I want to preface that by saying that, you know, I respect the hell out of him. And he was a mentor of mine. He made me a better Rio when I was a first tour lieutenant. So Leo gets the radar contact. First one's about 78 miles out. So they see that this contact is speeding up, going about 400 knots and accelerating and climbing. So they vector towards it. Now, the other thing to note with respect to the ROE. So now it's 1989. Remember I described the 1981 ROE, the Reagan-era ROE, Rules of Engagement, where you had to wait until you got shot at. Do not fire until fired upon. Now, in 1989, it's more permissive. And that comes into play here um, as this unfolds. So basically, the ROE, the Sixth Fleet ROE, was if you have somebody coming at you, turn away. And if they turn into you, turn away again. If they turn into you three times total, now they can be engaged. Okay, so that's different than the ROE where you got to wait to actually get shot at. The other thing to note is the F-14 backseat presentation had an anomaly when you were in the track while scan mode, which is kind of the franchise radar mode. So that's one that would allow you to track 24 targets and, and so forth. And the way it worked is the AUG-9 would need to see each radar contact every 2.4 seconds to update it, and then it would extrapolate between those 2.4 second time frames. So that's kind of a slow update rate, and what would happen is if you changed your heading, that symbology would make it look like the airplane that you were going against had turned. So you could actually create the illusion that the airplane was jinking into you. And that's kind of what happened here. And that was, in fact, verified by the E-2 Hawkeye that was the controlling airplane. As they came back, they're like, I didn't see that airplane jinking into you at, at all. But all Leo knows is what he's seeing. And so in his mind, he's complied with the ROE. Now, the other thing you hear is Alpha Bravo, who's the admiral on the carrier, comes up and tells him what the weapon status is. Close out 
Got uh, warning yellow, weapons hold, I repeat, warning yellow, weapons hold, Alpha Bravo out. Roger, okay. Gypsies, pass up, Bravo, Durex, warning yellow, weapons hold. 35 miles here. Okay, so what you hear there is the Admiral says, warning yellow, weapons hold, meaning you're not cleared to fire until you hear it from me. So what they need to hear subsequent to yellow and hold is red and free. Okay, so you hear the E-2 close out, relay that to Gypsy. That's the tactical call sign of the F-14s. And Leo, the lead Rio, doesn't really acknowledge it. He, he doesn't. So what we say in the business is he's already got the knife in the teeth, meaning He's, he's kind of ready uh, to, to commit a weapon here, okay? Now, they continue heading towards the contact. They don't know how many airplanes. They don't know what type of airplane they might be. So what you hear in the communications subsequent to that communication is they're heading downhill because they want to get below the Libyan airplane. Because what they know is the Soviet-era fighters that they have have terrible radars. And they're even worse when they're looking down. So, smart move to get down below the Libyan airplanes. So then, when they get closer... They've actually, in Leo's mind, met the ROE in terms of having jinked into him for at least three times. In fact, they've done it five times. So now Leo's ready to start firing some missiles. What you can hear is the skipper in his front seat is not as convinced. So listen to this. It's a very interesting uh, communications exchange. Okay, buggies have jinked back at me again for the fifth time. They're on my nose now. Inside of 20 miles. Master arm on, master arm on. See, good light. Good light. Okay, centering up the T. Buggy has jinked back into me again. 16 miles, center of the gap. Say your angels. I'm at angels five, nose up. His angels. Oh, wait a minute. Angels are at nine. Alpha Bravo from 207. 13 miles. Fox one. Fox one. Oh, Jesus. He's been right. Roger that. 10 miles. He's back on my nose. Fox one again. Okay, a couple of things to note with what we just heard. First, you hear Leo say, he's jinked into me for a fifth time. So again, he doesn't care anymore about what Alpha Bravo says about the weapon status is yellow and hold. Because now, in accordance with the rules of engagement, the what the bandit has done eclipses, eclipses the weapon status. Now the ROE is, I can fire because of what this enemy has done in terms of jinking into me more than three times. So that's the first thing to note. And then you hear the wing pilot, Munster, first tour lieutenant, ask, what's his angels? And so Leo says, his altitude. And Munster repeats, no, his angels. And so Leo calls for master arm on. So a Rio can't shoot a sparrow, which is what a fox one is. You hear him say fox one, but a Rio can't shoot a sparrow by himself, right? Hot trigger logic is what we call it, requires that you have a radar lock. So he goes out of track while scan mode into a lock. So now the radar is not scanning more. Now it's just locked on one target. So they lock up the lead contact. Munster and Steve lock up the wingman. And pilot has master arm on. So 
you can tell that the skipper, Beads, is conflicted, right? He pings Alpha Bravo again. Alpha Bravo, say weapon status. He does not get an answer. Leo's already there. Why are you asking for weapon status? We've met the ROE requirements to engage, right? So hot trigger, you know, it's not just Leo going crazy in the back seat. The pilot put master arm on. So now you have a hot trigger. The Rio can fire a sparrow from the back seat. Three weapons, Sidewinder, Sparrow, Phoenix. Two of them could be fired from the back seat, Sparrow and Phoenix, in certain parameters. So Leo fires Fox 1 at 13 miles, which is kind of an R max shot, max range shot. And you hear beads go, oh, Jesus. <laughs> like, I have missiles flying off my airplane. My Rio's, you know, gone hog wild here. So that's kind of humorous um, in terms of pilot Rio interaction. Um, now, what you also hear is about eight seconds later, Leo fires a second sparrow, which makes the first one go stupid. Okay, so as soon as you fire a second sparrow, that first one stops guiding. So that's, that's bad on Leo. Um, and you'll hear that they're, they're kind of, you know, high pressure, lost in the, in the moment, that, that, that kind of um, makes some bad, bad calls here in the lead airplane. Meanwhile, the wing airplane, Munster and Steve, are just tracking along, watching these two sparrows come off, and um, they, they don't guide. Okay, so now they're coming at each other, 1,200 knots or so, right? And at about four miles separation, Munster says, they've turned on me. And so at that point, he shoots a sparrow and it guides. So again, airplanes are, are have, you know, 1,500 knots, 1,200 knots of closure. So you launch a, a missile, it Missile time of flight, a couple of seconds. By the time it hits, they're almost merged. And what Munster described to me is it looked like, um, you know, Challenger exploding. That was the analogy he used. Um, and, and so this flaming wreckage goes by him. And now Beads is engaged and settles in with the other one. And so let's take a listen to that. Fox two, select Fox two. I have Fox two. Coming hard, stop. No fucking shoot him. I don't got time. Got the second one. I got the second one on the nose right now. Hey, I'm high cover on you. Get a fox. Get a lock him up. Lock him up. Man, shoot him, Fox two. I clear. I don't have a fucking phone. So what? So that sequence, what we heard was as Beads is saddled in behind the other airplane, you hear Leo telling him to select Fox 2, which is Sidewinder. And because he still has Sparrow selected. And if you look at the control stick in the front cockpit, there's a little toggle that the pilot manipulates with his thumb. And in the HUD, the heads-up display, you can tell which weapon you have selected. So, again, bad on the lead pilot for not having the right weapon selected. Fortunately, this bandit was not turning very hard. It wasn't you know, we, we don't know what the seniority was or whatever, but he wasn't fighting the airplane in a way where those seconds of switchology problems with the Tomcat mattered. So you hear Leo coax Beads a few times about select Fox 2, and Beads is saying, I can't get a fucking tone, and the reason he can't get a fucking tone 
is because he's not in Sidewinder. And then Leo says one last time, select Fox and Beads figures it out. And then you hear the blaring oral tone. That's the IR tone. You hear that you have a good heat signature. That's screaming missile tone. Shoots the Sidewinder and it guides. And you also note that the presentation goes from the television TCS presentation to the HUD at trigger squeeze. So you see the whole missile tunnel flight of the Sidewinder through the HUD presentation until it hits. You see that plume of flame and smoke and that pilot ejected. So you hear Munster say the guy ejected. If you listen to the full tape of the entire intercept and, and the comms afterwards, they say, I see two good shoots. Now, what Intel showed afterwards was that they had uh, the, the lead pilot, the first guy that was shot um, uh, didn't, didn't survive um, the explosion. So that was the second Gulf of Sidra incident. On the back side of this, um, there were mixed reviews about how much of a threat were these two floggers, MiG-23s, um, they did create a diagram that the president actually presented um, that showed that they did have AA-7s, um, Apex missiles on the wings. The MiG-23 is a fighter, very fast fighter, not terribly maneuverable, but small, fast fighter. Um, but what Intel also showed is those... Uh, Libyan airplanes never turn their radars on. So the crews did earn the title of MiG killers. In fact, the lead Rio, um, I didn't see it, but reportedly got a vanity plate that said MiG killer on his new Corvette, which made him the, the target of some grief, as you might imagine. So being MiG, MiG killers makes you part of a rare breed in modern warfare. But the instructors at Top Gun summarized particularly lead aircraft's performance in, in less than glowing terms. It's also a telltale that fighter pilot of the year honors that year went to the wing pilot, not the lead pilot. So that sort of tells you all you need to know about how the community felt about how this incident went down. All right, that'll do it for this episode. A lot of new subscribers. And I'm super happy about the support. I appreciate it very much. So if you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell. Give me a thumbs up. These matter a lot. Make a comment. I love the comments. I try to answer as many as I can, as you've seen. Share. And I look forward to talking to you again very soon.